Hello, welcome to Spirit Laced. My name is Demitoko David. Today we'll be talking about dealing with moral problems. Dealing with moral problems, and our text is going to be taken from the book of First Corinthians, chapter one, verse ten to thirteen, and the same First Corinthians, chapter three, verse one to seventeen. First Corinthians, chapter one, First Corinthians, chapter one, ten to thirteen, and First same Corinthians, First Corinthians, chapter three, verse one to seventeen. Amen. So this is the outdoor class in case you're wondering. And yes, I know we've been having a little bit of a difficulty uploading some of this content. Um, I do apologize for that, but hopefully things will get back to normal. And um, because I was also away for a convention and um, uh, the network is pretty, 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 pretty bad. So I couldn't do all of that, but hopefully it's going to get better. The essential truth for our text, our lesson is um, Christians are called to live and walk in unity christians are called to live and walk in unity and our memory verse is taken from the book of first corinthians chapter 1 verse 10 first corinthians chapter 1 verse 10 it says now i plead with you brethren by the name of the of our lord jesus christ that you all speak the same the same thing and that there be no division among you but that you will be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Amen. The evangelism emphasis today is that unity in the church helps to verify the gospel that um, the gospel to the unsaved. Unity in the church helps to verify the gospel to the unsaved. You know, if you look at how Christianity has evolved, um, the relationship of how um, how Christians have evolved with time and with season and with everything has actually sort of like um created a lot of division among the body of christ the systems of this world has been put in place thus so that morality just morality will be preached in the church but that is not what the gospel is all about the gospel is all about the power of christ the gospel is centered on jesus christ you know, these days they have refined the gospel to the point whereby people are getting more moral, people are getting more religious, people are getting more, I mean, the young people are getting rude and very disrespectful, very unruly. Um, even in the church, um, you can see the division among the workers as well among the pastors and the leaders. Um, you can also see a lot that is going on in, on the social media space. You'll be hearing this person calling out the other person and again that is taking away from this is just the work of the enemy trying to divide the church and you know when we lose the sense of what the gospel is we forget and we start fighting and we start causing this unity amongst the church um in this class we'll be looking at um um, three outlined. The first one is to pursue unity, pursue unity. To, the second is to pursue spiritual maturity. And the third is to build on Christ. The third is to build on Christ. Again, because of our time, we'll not be looking at all the, uh, the lessons, all, all the text. But just for, just for context purposes, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 1, verse 3 to... Um, First Corinthians chapter 1, bear with me one minute, verse 10 to 13. So verse 10 to 13, it says, Now I plead with you, my brethren, I'm reading from the New King James Version, it says, Now I plead with you, my brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Cleo's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. The question is, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Again, if you look at what is happening in the 
I mean, I, I, just, I just do not want to call out names. But again, when you look at people who are supposed to be leaders, who, are, who we look at, who, who we see as pace setters, who we see as anointed men of God or ministers of God, calling out each other for things that are absolutely irrelevant. And it's because they fail to understand that the place where God has called them is not the place for you to call out other people. And this is causing division in the body of Christ. It's causing division among the denomination. It causes the divisions among, you know, among Christians themselves. However, if we, if we bring our focus back on Jesus, the gospel is all about Jesus. It's supposed to be centered around Jesus. When we have our leaders who are being divided, what, what becomes of the followers? What becomes of people that they are being discipled? what becomes of the workforce, what becomes of the members. It gives them the opportunity to be able to do the same. The, the, Jesus says that he wants us to be like him. Besides, we need to understand that it is the religious people that killed Jesus. Christianity is not about religion. Again, it is not about religion. It is centered on Jesus Christ. Anything other than that is not the gospel. Anything other than taking away yeah there's a place for teaching there's a place for trying to understand the scripture but I, I i dare say that even the scripture can be understood by people who have not gone to church you know church is supposed to be a place where we come together and to fellowship in unity where we can have a covenanted relationship fellowship time and you know allow God to move. But now when the body of Christ is being desecrated by so many irrelevant things, it then that body does not represent the body of Christ. So unity is essential in the body of Christ. There is power shortage where unity is lacking. Achievement is limited where there is no unity as well. Progress is also very much hindered where unity is absent. Unity creates a conducive atmosphere for the spirit of God to operate. Imagine you go to a you go to a church service, and then obviously you are you you are looking forward to God. I need you to touch me. I need you to speak to me. I need you to be here in this service and all that. And you walk into that into that you know church service, and then by the time the the chorister starts, you would actually tell when you walk into the place when the when the chorister uh, or the prayer people start, depending on the order of service, by the way, but irrespective of what the order of service is. I mean, I've been to, I've been to fellowship in places and the moment one person walk on stage and they open their mouth and they say one thing that I know is wrong, I already know that that service is not, it's not a service where God is, irrespective of how much you know, one thing can actually ruin the presence of God in a place where people are gathered to worship, in a place where people are gathered to seek God, where people, where the choristers have been, are supposed to help lead people into the, into the presence of God, where the prayer warriors are, are supposed to be, be there to charge people, to charge the atmosphere into the presence of God, where the, where the word, when the word comes, the word is supposed to come and stir up your spirit, stir up your soul and gather everybody into the presence of God and we can collectively connect to heaven, connect and God himself can be present in the service. You know, every opportunity to fellowship together in the body of Christ is not supposed to be taken lightly. So there have been to places whereby, you know, the moment one person just come on stage, I mean, on the altar of God, they're supposed to be sanctified. They're supposed to have, you know, people who are only sanctified. They open their mouth and they say something all because they want to, you know, stir up the people to worship. I mean, if your spirit filled, you know that you, are, you go into the presence of God, you go into the place of fellowship with other brethren. You want to connect so that it can be in unity. And you know, the Bible says that where two or three are gathered in my name, it is there. And now that same Bible says that can two walk together 
except they, they agree. It's not possible. Now, if another person is coming, comes on the altar and says something that is not supposed to be said, it takes away the, 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 the opportunity for God to move most, in most cases. And so, sometimes it takes that opportunity away because the person who is talking or who is saying the wrong thing has actually hindered the people from receiving from God. They have hindered the people from connecting to God. So in that same understanding, you know, I, 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 have, I, I was privileged to go to different churches and, you know, there are places you go and say, okay, yes, I, I, I could feel the presence of God. You come away, you're, you're blessed. But I have been to, you, to, to, to services whereby at the blink of maybe one person trying to lead the worship, I already know that this place, no. This is not the Spirit of God working here. I already know, even just by the way they sing. You know, sometimes it's not really how your voice is. It's not really how, you know, how professional your, your singing voice is. There, there, has to be a, there has to be an anointing. Your voice might not even be as good as an opera singer or a classical singer, but there is, there is something called the anointing. There is something called the Spirit of God that when somebody who is Spirit-filled picks up the microphone to sing, you already know, you can actually tell that, yes, this person is filled with the Holy Spirit. And then you can relax and allow, you know, and join that person to usher, so you, you can be ushered together into the presence of God and you can connect. So I, I, if unity is not in the church and the lack of understanding, it brings about, it brings about a whole lot of, a whole lot of um, a, a, a division. See, sometimes we are tribal, as tribal as we are at times, we know that we are created for one another. And the great um, diversity that we are that that we are is is what enriched our uh, enriches our lives. There is beauty in the, in diversity, but there is also power in unity. Now, if we look at the first outline, which is pursue unity, according to First Corinthians chapter one verse ten to seventeen that I've that I've just read. See, Paul founded the Corinthian church on a second mission, on a second missionary journey. He spent about eighteen months in Corinth after which he left the church to be pastored by a man called Apollos. When he left, argument and division arose together with some other problems which Paul had to address. So again, you have to read it, uh, you, had, you have to read the text so that you can basically understand. So Paul had great um, themes to deal with in that church in at Corinth, such as incest, getting drunk at the lost table, obviously. I mean, some people, use the opportunity to have the Holy Communion to have their fill. It talked about all sorts of adultery, uh, worshipping idol, idolatry, and many other great sins. But what is the first thing that Paul dealt with here in this episode? It was division. Division, and of course, is the, the problem is of the people. Paul learned that there were four parties in the church. So um, if you want to look at it, we'll, we'll look at the a Pauline party, those who cling to the founder of their church. You know, there are situations whereby, you know, um, there's a founder of a church who, who, who started the church, who God commissioned to start the church. And then if the founder maybe passes on or there is a new founder, depending on the policies and the uh, governance of the church or how the Lord wants to take that body into the next phase, when there's a new person who comes to take over the church, some people will feel very, very angry to say, well, after listening to this person's sermon, I don't think this person is like so, 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 and, and I don't think I can follow this person. And I, so again, they cling to the founder of their church. And those are probably, when, and when you do that, you're really missing the point. You're missing the point of fellowship. You're missing the point of the, the, the authority. You're missing the point of the gospel. So there are people who said, well, um, because it was Paul who founded the church, I'm going to, you know, stick with Paul's doctrine and all that. And then there are other people 
who were also the party of Apollos, those who were, who were probably carried away by the admir uh, admiration of his maybe, I, I would suggest, an Alexandrian philosophy. And there are also party of uh, Judaizers, who, those who claim to uh, um, be following Peter. And the fourth party were people who were claiming to be, um, to be different from all human followers and to be only of Christ. We, we get this set of people in the church. There are people who say, well, irrespective of what, whatever is happening here, I am for Jesus, I am for Christ. It doesn't concern me what is going on. Again, when you do that, there is division. If, you, if you're saying, well, okay, I'm going to just follow the apostles. Um, I'm going to follow the apostles' uh, way of doing things. Again, when you do that in a place where you're supposed to be a place of fellowship, that means there's a division there. When you are just for the founder, you remember Christ is the head of the church. If we forget the place of Christ and we begin to look at the people and we begin to lift people above God, it brings about division. See, whether it be the, you know, Paul began to wonder whether the current quarrel had divided Christ into fraction. And again, you can see that some people physically raised up their hand to say, I am for Paul, I am with Peter's because Peter's, uh, Peter has some, you know, Judaism um, doctrine in his, in his teachings. And, and then obviously I am for Jesus, I am for this. So again, we need to be careful. We have to pursue unity regardless. So wherever you are, try to understand in the body of Christ, unity is very important. With unity, you can achieve a whole lot of things. When the body is united, it is easy to pray and win. It is, it is, it is easy to testify. It is easy to pray and expect God to move, both collectively and even in the, and even in the body of Christ and in, in, in the individual as well. Now, if we look at pursue spiritual maturity, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 to 8. So I'm going to quickly uh, read that, 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 3, verse 1 to 8. It says, And I, brethren, cannot speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you're still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and division among you, you are, not, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another say, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollo watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither he who plants is anything or he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now, he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one should, will receive his own reward according to his labor. See, Paul described their life of this division. I'm going to be this is because of the lack of maturity, the lack of understanding of the kingdom principle, the lack of understanding of what Jesus has done for them. It is the lack of understanding of understanding there is power in unity. The Bible says one will chase a thousand and two, ten thousand, and imagine what three people can do. Imagine what five, ten people can do when they are united. Paul described them that they that their life is like the life of a baby Christian, a cry baby that is so so you know, and and this type of men they are characterized by you know they are helpless you know because he's a new born infant if you if you look at a baby a baby cannot clean up themselves they only cry when they need maybe when they when they're hungry or when they need to look when, when they need to to be to be cleaned and again he said that this type of christian has not been able to receive anything yet but milk the only thing they can feed on is milk you cannot offer them any solid food because their stomach will not be able to digest it and so is it with any christian who is part or a key you know a key divider 
of the church it means that you are not yet matured in the things of god irrespective or regardless of how long you've been in the church as christians we are expected to grow from just milk into solid food and breaking bones it is not just sitting down and and waiting to be fed and waiting to 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 be cleaned up but we we need to walk we need to we need to mature ourselves by reading the scripture by asking god to help us the holy spirit is there to do these things this type of people are people that walk and talk like an unsaved person in fact their perspective to life is just so carnal it's so carnal that you wonder at these people as are, are, are these people um are these people christians are they christians are, are you, when when they see when they see when you see how they respond to 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 to, to certain conversations you begin to wonder i mean are, 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 are you are, are you are you a christian and then you begin to understand how they you begin to listen to how they interpret the scriptures and you begin to wonder sorry is it the same bible we are reading is it the same holy spirit that is helping us that is that is helping us that is helping you too you know they begin to talk and the bible says for to be carnally minded is death but spirit to but to be spiritually minded is life and peace everything is just liberal it doesn't matter it doesn't mean it's not that deep those are there are some christians like that who do not understand the spiritual principles of things who do not understand the kingdom principles of things and who are not ready they are not ready so the next people are the ones who, who talk and, and walk like they walk and talk like an unsafe person they are not ready and another category of people are the ignorant they are ignorant of spiritual things they are so ignorant that everything doesn't matter it's not that deep how can you say this is spiritual how can you say this is that actually it's not that deep just 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 look online you find your you find your answers there you know the critical and logical mind minded people they like to use logic for everything logic for why is this not going forward logic for how come we're divided what logic for why is this person saying this you're supposed to be saying this there are people like that then he also compares spiritual leaders you know instead of spiritual truth those there are people who the, the, the other category of people are people who compare spiritual leaders instead of spiritual truth we find it some people who are, who are saying i'm of paul and the other is saying i'm of apollos we still have them in the church oh i am from i am for this church I am not for that church. I think our founder is better than yours. I think we are doing a lot better in terms of ministry, in terms of edifice. Have you seen our auditorium? We're doing a whole lot. They, they begin to compare spiritual leaders, what is lacking, the quality that is lacking here, and then the quality that is not there. Those are people, those are wrong set of people in the church. And instead of, instead of looking at spiritual truths, these are people who are not able to discern. They cannot discern the times. They cannot discern the, 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 the moment that God is about to move. So they just sweep everything under the carpet. So when Paul was at Corinth, he treated them as babes, teaching them just the simple rudiment principle. Brother Paul enumerates some element that hinders growth in verse two um, to three, which must be avoided. They are things like lack of interest in the things of God, carnality of mind, envy one another, strife among brethren, division in the body of Christ, walking in the flesh and fulfilling the desires of the flesh. In the school of Christ, like all others, discipleship training must be adapted to the advancement of, of the learner. You have, if you've said that, yes, I have given my life to Christ and you want to take your work seriously with God, you have to come under discipleship to learn. And spiritual maturity is a process. It's not something that comes upon you. It is a process. You go through the thick and the thin. 
Sometimes if you're very, very hard and your heart is hardened, the Lord knows how to handle you and bring you to your knees and bring you to the end of yourself. So spiritual matur maturity is a process and it is attainable even as young convert when you begin to expose yourself to the word of God that is taught in different ways. You take advantage of regularly attending Bible studies, attend some the school, go for prayer meetings, go for Bible prayer meetings, go for house fellowship. When there is an when, when, when they, there's call for house fellowship, attend, be one of the first few people to attend. Allow yourself to learn, to learn. And you must be willing to pay the price required for growth. You must be willing to pay the price that is required for growth. Now, let, for growth. Now, let's look at the total line, which is to build on Christ. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 to 17, because of our time. Okay, let's quickly, let's quickly read it from 9 to 17. It says, for we, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can, can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become, will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If any one work which he has built on, is, on it endures, it will receive a re reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss for himself or be saved. Yet so as through, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple are, which temple you are? See, Paul said he laid the foundation and not a foundation when he was preaching Christ in Corinth because God's spiritual temple can have only one foundation. After Paul left Corinth. Apollos and other teachers continued to build upon the foundation that Paul laid. This is a this is just a sound a, a note of warning. If you don't know what the scripture is saying, if you don't read the scripture, you might find it difficult to know which which to discern the spirit of truth. When people because there are pe people are very very you know smart and they they come with very eloquent um, ways of putting things they become crafty on how to present false information as truth and if you're not discerning you would it, it will actually sound right it will make a whole lot of sense but that's not the truth in this day and age we can see a whole lot of people coming up as as prophets as uh, pastors as apostles as uh, pastors as uh, evangelists as a whole lot there are some people who are working in the five fivefold ministry some in the one two three four five either or some people are you know these days there's so many um um the the, the thank god for the internet and sometimes you also would say okay actually do we really need it again so we need to be careful some people might start 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 very well the call of god upon their life might be that of fire and uh and wind and everything but by the time they begin to allow carnality they begin to allow certain things in the body of christ they begin to grow cold and then their teaching begins to change because you know they they, they feel like they are now a boss and they feel like their ministry is growing therefore it gives them the opportunity to actually you know change it and twist it and tweak it so that it can fit in the gen in the current generation listen regardless of whatever generation we are in jesus christ is still lord regardless of whatever generation we are in jesus christ is still the only way the truth and the life regardless of whether we're in gen z or whether we're in the millennial or whether we are in what not the gospel still remains the same so we cannot just be tweaking things jesus died on one cross on that same cross 
it didn't die according to how Gen Z's want to put it. It didn't die according to how millennials want to say it. It didn't die. I mean, there's a new generation that they're talking about. It didn't die according to anybody's generation. It died so that you and I can be saved. And that is what the gospel is all about. There's no division around that. So Paul, Paul likens the church, uh, the church to God's field and God's building. And he wants that everyone building on this foundation should be careful of the quality of, of, of the quality of the material which they are build, which they are building so that they can withstand fire of testing. You know, um, and this is just a, 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 a word. In case you, you started very well with so much fire, please go back to the basics. Go back to the foundation. The foundation is Christ. Any other thing that has been that has been attached to the foundation, it's no longer Christ. Okay? And I pray that the Lord will help us all in Jesus' name. See, teachings should have the goal of modeling Christ in, in a believer's life. They are erroneous doctrine and unsound teaching. Are materials described as wood, hay, stubble, and this will be revealed as the challenges of life arises. I think I, I was looking, I was watching, I watched a clip about one person who was being, who said he wanted his tithe and offering back in the church. Obviously, I am I'm, I'm not blaming that person. In fact, I'm not condemning that person. I I, I can actually say it is because that person was not really told. The truth about Christ you know is there's a place for prosperity teaching and there's a place for teaching Jesus for revealing Jesus and asking Jesus to be revealed to people because these religious people are the same people who kills Jesus so Christianity you know we just when you when you look at it we're just talking religion 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 but when the name Jesus Christ is being mentioned it is not a religion it is a relationship it is a father to child, father to son, father to daughter relationship. It is a family affair. It's a kingdom affair. It's not a religion. So, um, when we look at the materials that are that 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 are, that are mentioned in our text, see the structure will not survive um, fire testing if the materials are you know substantial and they will not pass the test of time. And these and and. Precious and imperishable wood would mold men into the image of Christ. A Christian who will be able to withstand adverse and difficult con conditions must embrace balanced biblical doctrine. Because it is one thing to sell the gospel of wealth and people keep coming and yet they are not blessed. That is not what the gospel is about. In fact, to twitch it around, the Bible says that seek ye first the kingdom of God and all those things will be added unto you. The fact that you're a Christian does not mean you're going to be poor. No. But there has to be a balanced biblical doctrine. So that when Jesus is revealed, because I was I think I was talking to the Holy Spirit one day, I was like, ah, I was talking to Jesus. I said, Jesus, to give life, to give my life to Jesus is a very simple thing. But to walk with Jesus, oh goodness me, it's not a walk in the park. Is actually not a walk in the park at all. Giving your life to Jesus is the first thing and is the most important thing. However, staying on course and staying the course for course, <laughs> a the test will come, wind will blow, there's going to be boisterous wind, there's going to be storms, but your biblical ground and understanding of Jesus is what will see you to the end before Christ really comes to storm. The fact that you gave your life to Jesus is not a magic wand, but it's wonder. It's a wonder that happens. And, you know, the enemy wants to attack Christ in you, he wants, you wants, wants to make you to leave Christ. So the teaching that will challenge one to become more like Christ is not something that it's not just based on prosperity teaching or on grace teaching there has to be a balance it has to be balanced it has to be balanced now let's look at life application and manifestation life application and conclusion see manifestation of divisive spirit is a sign of carnality immaturity and stunted spiritual and it, and this stunned spiritual growth 
The sign of a maturing Christian is he who hungers and thirsts for the word of truth. It shows progressive growth and maintain a consistent relationship with the Holy Spirit. To remain a baby Christian is to cause problem and disunity in the body of Christ even for yourself. This does not add value to the body, neither does it represent the virtues of Christ. How important unity is to Jesus was shown in his prayer recorded in John chapter 17, 11b to, to 19. And it says, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given to me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But I now, but now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Just I am, just as I am not of the world, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just I am, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also I have sent them into the world for their sakes. I sanctify them that they also may be sanctified by the truth. When we dwell in unity, God commands his blessing upon us. Psalms 33, uh, Psalm 113 verse 1 and 3. See, nothing derails Christ's vision more than this unity in this rank. If you have not subscribed to the YouTube channel, please do so right now. I want you to, um, and also share this, share this video. I believe it will bless one or two persons. Again, um, just so you can join in the in the conversation, leave it in the comment section if you can. Um, the question will be, how can we handle the plague of disunity in the church? How do you think, as Christians, we can handle the plague of disunity in the church? And how can we put an end to gossiping, bickering, and discord in the church? How can we put an end to gossiping, bickering, and discord in the church? And the last thing is, how can you be helped? How can you be helped to serve God better? How can you help to serve God better? Be of help to serve God better. So this is Spirit Laced. We have now come to the end of this class. Please follow, like. Uh, we're on YouTube, we're on um, Instagram and Facebook. Leave a comment. My name is Demitoka David. Till I come your way some other time, have a wonderful week. Take care now. God bless you.